Good morning, everybody. Once again, my name is Eli Farron. I'm a deputy city attorney with the city of Oakland. I'm the only attorney assigned to our ABAT unit, which is our alcohol beverage action team. Um, so we're going to go through a quick introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. Jennifer Senna is going to talk about education and enforcement, and we're going to split case studies in half. So getting started. Since you guys had a nice map, we decided to put a nice map together also. So this is a beautiful map of the city of Oakland. It's 78 square miles, a population of a little bit over 400,000 from the 2012 census. So it's divided up into uh, five police districts with 35 beats. So beautiful map of the city of Oakland. Then this is the uh, city of Oakland with our liquor licenses. So totally, there is 984 total liquor, li liquor licenses. And only, out that 984, only 360 of them are in our deemed approved program. So the goals of our unit is, what we really want to do is help make bad liquor stores good ones. We want to shut down ugly stores. We want to help build uh, safer communities. Um, we're really not here to just shut down every store just because they sell liquor. We want to it just would be bad. We don't want to shut down like a tax base. So typically we're willing to work with the community. We're willing to work with the business owners and they're 99% of the time they're willing to work with us. So the number one thing or complaint I get when I go to community meetings or meet with council members is why don't we revoke their liquor license? It's a very easy, easy answer. Well, we don't have the power. We're preemptive. That's the state power under the state constitution. So only the state alcohol beverage control has the power to shut down somebody's liquor license. But what the local entity has the power to do, we have the authority to go over someone's land use and determine um, like when they can open, when they can close, and other um, restrictions on their particular property. So our deemed approved program started in 1993 and it was adopted by the city council. Deemed approved means basically legal, non-conforming alcohol beverage retailers. So these were basically the businesses that came in these were the businesses that existed prior to the enactment of our ordinance. So, and within our ordinance, we basically set up um, very simple, basic performance standards with regards to nuisance. So you can't have people loitering, you can't sell drugs, you can't sell expired food, things like that. So, new licensees uh, are required to join our program with a conditional use permit, which is a CUP. Originally, we had um, ABC licenses 41 and 47, which are full service restaurants. But we currently don't have them in anymore. It, um, I guess the council felt that it wasn't necessary to include them. But every municipality may have a different reason for having restaurants or not having restaurants. It's not really a one size fits all. And what, um, what basically our uh, program does is provide for education, monitoring, enforcement efforts for licensed ABC establishments. So once a year, we do a program where we train um, business owners. I also go to neighborhood crime prevention council meetings and talk to community members about what problems they are having with particular liquor stores or, or bars. So, so our fee is 1500 a year, which is pretty high. It was originally $600. What this fee does is pay for two police officers, Jennifer Senna being one of them, and Officer Joe Kroshauer, myself being a deputy city attorney, and three civilian staff, equipment, training, and operations. And basically, um, for things to be a fee, it has to be co cost covering, but we'll get into that later. For 2013, our total gross revenue was over $900,000, which is pretty good. So basically, going to our performance standards, the premises must be free of nuisance activities. These include drug activity, disturbance of the peace, street drinking, drunkenness, loitering, harassment, vandalism, graffiti, excess litter, public urination and violence, which is basically, I don't think any business owner wants that in front of their property anyway. So it, it makes it safe, not just for the community members, but also for the business and their employees and their customers. We also have required signage, which basically says um, what I just covered. It's letting the uh, people who work there know what the performance standards are, but also people who come and visit. Um, individuals who want to buy a beer, they can see what their performance standards are. And uh, one of the biggest defenses we typically get for some of the bad liquor stores is typically it's the only area where people can get milk and diapers from in their neighborhoods. 
So my council district, for example, I believe there's only one grocery store. So, but there are a lot of liquor stores in my neighborhood. So we have a baby here, very, very cute. Nobody's gonna have a problem with this baby coming into your store and buying milk and diapers. But nobody's gonna go get milk and diapers from any of these stores when there's murders or people are, um, when there's vandalism, if they're loitering. Or if you don't feel safe, you're not gonna go to a store. So what we really try to do with our, our ordinance is um, make the store safe where everybody feels comfortable going there to get their milk and diapers. With regards to the business and profession code, I guess a lot of policymakers would have to do with this. Um, you have to look at business code section 23790. It's basically talking about your grandfather land use, which I hinted on a little bit earlier. So basically, if you um, have these ordinances come into play, that the people who were operating their businesses prior to the establishment of the ordinance, they get grandfathered in. You really can't like put restrictions on people legally because of due process issues and notice. Um, you can't put the restrictions on them after, so they're grandfathered in. You just have to be careful with that and always think about that. But also think about that. It only protects those alcohol re retailers like with regards to closures. Um, it'll protect people with closures if it's not in excess of 30 days or it's because of an act of God or a toxic accident. So there's a lot of case law with regards to what constitutes an act of God. So for example, a riot does not constitute an act of God. Or we've had a situation in Oakland where um, Two guys are speeding, one guy loses control of his car and slams into the front of a business. And because of that, the business had to close down. With us, it was over 90 days. Our ordinance allows people to be inactive for 90 days before you lose your deemed approved status. But this guy couldn't reopen his business, and because of that, he lost his deemed approved status with the city. And it was through no fault of his own. Car went through. Um, he was waiting for his um, insurance to come in and pay everything. But because of that, he lost his status. But as a result, though, just because you lose your deemed approved status with the city of Oakland doesn't mean your store has to shut down. So he just has to go back to zoning and apply for either a major variance or a conditional use permit with zoning. The first court case we had challenging our ordinance was in 1996. And it was basically a fight to, um, to determine whether or not our ordinance was a tax or a fee. So, and since uh, 1996, Prop 26 has come out in 2010. So you have to consult your council with regards to this, but basically you have to look at, um, for something to be a fee, you want a cost covering. If things are taxes, you might have a, a, a little bit of a harder time to pass through your, um, with your council and also with your constituents. And uh, with ours, we just basically have it calculated. How much does it cost to have two police officers? How much does it ha cost to have an attorney? How much does it, ha how much does it cost to have three staff members, how much does the equipment cost? So we put that all in there, we uh, compute it, and the 1500 basically covers all that, so it's a fee and not a tax. The case also said that we may properly enact a local ordinance to control abate nuisance activities, despite the fact that the, the business was grandfathered in. So just because you're grandfathered in with your liquor and land use, we can still go after you because you're creating a nuisance. So you have to think about attacking the nuisance and not necessarily the liquor license. And a lot of people kind of confuse the two, especially when I go to community meetings. They want to go after the liquor license, the liquor license, the liquor license. We have to go after the land use, the land use, the land use. So a city council can determine what is a nuisance, and a city council may bring action to abate the nuisance. And that's kind of when I come in. We kind of determine what the nuisance is, and then we go after that particular nuisance. So is a nuisance loitering? What conditions can you put on a business to stop loitering? Is it drug dealing? What can you do to stop the drug dealing? What time is the drug dealing? What time is the loitering? Um, is there graffiti? How long does the graffiti stay up? Who's putting the graffiti up? Is it from people living at a hotel nearby? Or So we try to figure out what's the problem, what's the nuisance, and how to abate the nuisance as a result. Also, um, I guess for the police officers here, if a business imposes an unusual burden on city services, a municipality may properly impose fees pursuant to its police powers so officers can recover extraordinary police services costs. So that's just not an officer just riding by once a day on his regular beat. But if you guys have to go because of the shootings or you, you have to go because of constant loitering, constant drug dealing, officers can compute that together, put it on a chart, and you can recover it. So, and also when um, 
putting together the business of profession code, the state legislator did not intend for a person who has a liquor license to be immune from all local supervision. So something also to think about. And in this particular situation, the city of Oakland did not require the business to seek a, a conditional use permit. So it was legal what we did. A case close to San Diego, Bauer versus the city of San Diego. And that case came out in 1999. And it's just basically a due process case. And um, I believe ABC went to this location a couple of times a month, and there were several instances of um, the business owners selling to minors. So as a result of it, ABC had restricted, or really suspended, the liquor license at the location for 60 days. And, but it was still a grandfather business. So from reading the case, it looked like the city of San Diego basically changed the, the person's zoning ordinance. I mean, their zoning, um, their uses, basically, and changed the, they said it changed the character of their operation. But basically what happened with this, what the court said is, um, they're still allowed a hearing. So even if they did close and they, their use has changed, you're still required to have a hearing. And it was just very simple. And basically once a licensee is required a CUP or has grandfather status, the municipality's power to revoke is very limited. So for example, with the city of Oakland, for a revocation for the city of Oakland, we require two hearings. There can be an appeal to a commission and an appeal to council before being administratively final. And even at that point, people can still fight it and bring up a writ. In the city of Oakland though, typically for our first hearing, we have it waived. So we'll sit down with the business owner and talk to them about what the problems are. We bring up the police reports. We're very, very transparent. So we'll show them the police report, show them the dates of everything. We'll go back typically two or three years and determine how long the nuisance activity has been going on. So if it's, is it over five years? Is it a one-time thing? Is it a 20-time thing? And we'll basically um, come to a, an agreement and waive the first hearing. And in the first hearing with us, typically the, um, our restrictions are put and we basically come to agreements for the restrictions. So once again, if there's loitering, what time of day is it? Do they need better lighting? Are they properly taking down the graffiti? Are they selling to minors? Are they properly training their employees? So going on to inspections and education, I introduce Jennifer Senna. Why don't you change out the mic? Okay, so just a little bit about me. Um, you read my bio, I'm sure, right? <laughs> I've been on the department for 14 years. I know I don't look that old. Um, I've been uh, in patrol assignments in patrol. I've worked in vice, done the undercover uh, street walker thing, all kinds of stuff. Um, and I had the opportunity to go over to the alcoholic beverage action team in 2009. I knew very little about alcohol. All I knew is what I drank, you know, after work, off duty. But I learned so much in this unit and it's, I'm privileged to come here and share all my experiences, my mistakes and everything. So this is what our unit's all about, inspections and education. So here we have the cop, passed or fail, right? So I go into the stores and I do inspections. But the other component we have is training. So we provide free training as well. And I'm gonna go over some slides that I actually show the merchants. So that way everyone's on an even playing field because you know it's optional for them to come to train, it's not required. But when something bad happens, I can say, hey, you need to go to the training. I've conducted over 2,000 inspections, well over 2,000, that's probably a low number. Um, I've also done four merchant trainings um, during my tenure in ABAT. So I pretty much, you know, have do been doing this quite a long time. So inspections, so what do we check for? We check for those deemed approved standards that Mr. Farron has talked about. But what else do I do? I look for all ABC violations. I've received special training from the Alcoholic Beverage Control. We actually have an officer that comes over and actually has a, a desk in our unit. And I've been on hundreds of inspections with him. So basically, I'm like an ABC agent in a way, okay? I know everything, I can do any investigation uh, he can do, okay? But what else, what else do I look for? Well, there's other things too. Um, I look for rodents, I look for mold, I look for cold violations, fire violations. Why do I do that? I'm not a code inspector, right? 
because I need to pass that information on to uh, you know, building services and, and code enforcement because we need to get these issues addressed as well. So I'm basically the first line, right? So I'll tell you a quick story. I promise I won't tell a lot, okay? <laughs> so I go into, it's, uh, I, it's a late night inspection. We're doing uh, bars and liquor stores. We go into a liquor store. Immediately when I walk in, it smells really bad in there. It's gross. You know, I, I meet with the owner. Um, start looking in the coolers, mold everywhere. Just a rancid smell. So I go beyond the counter, it smells like a dead animal. Okay. I'm like, hey, uh, and then I look and there's mouse turds everywhere. So I go, hey, I go, what, you know, what's going on? You got a rum pump? Oh, no, no, nothing. Okay. All right, so then I look on the floor and there's a chip, chip display and there's like some chips hanging and I see one of the bags has chewed through and there's like a trail of popcorn. I said, where does this lead to, right? And it goes underneath the counter, and you can see the mouse turds, it goes underneath the counter all the way to the back room, storage closet. Look in there, a dead mouse. OD'd on popcorn, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story, true story. Now, with that case, I could have immediately called a health inspector from Alameda County Vector, and they would have red tagged that store, right then and there, made them get an exterminator, because that's not safe. Could you imagine if you're, you're a little, you know, a child grabbed that bag of popcorn and started eating it? I mean, rodent turds in there? No, right? Obviously, he wasn't sweeping, he wasn't cleaning, you know, so the store was a nuisance. It was a problem, okay? Good story, the, uh, good things happened with this. I ended up writing him up for the uh, violations I saw. Came back a week later and he had cleaned the store, got an exterminator, and there was no more rodent problem. So it was all based on, you know, my inspection. And Alameda County actually went out there later on and conducted their inspection as well. But I'm basically, you know, an ABI officer is actually the front line at the stores. So how do we, how do we select these locations? Because, you know, it's often people say it's not fair. You know, you're coming into my store, you know, we pay you and you, all you do is harass us, right? Well, we actually have a set criteria so that doesn't happen. So we go by neighborhood complaints, citizen complaints. We have a drug hotline unit, I mean a drug hotline where people can call in anonymously and report drug activity and they can also uh, report on stores and bars that are behaving badly. So that could be a reason I go in there. Um, obviously prior violations, so if we've had um, a sales case to minors, we obviously will go in there more than once in a year, right? Problem solving officers, those are the community policing officers. Sometimes they will request that I go into a store because uh, it's one of their beat projects, so I'll go in and do an inspection. Um, and then the data last inspection is huge. So let's say the store, I go in there and they passed with flying colors and I don't receive any more complaints, no community complaints, nothing. When do you think the next time I'm likely to go back there? Anyone guess? Yeah, it's actually 18 months because we have so many stores. It averages about 18 months. And we, we track all this information. So if a store says, oh, you know, that officer Cena, she's harassing me, I can say, hey man, I haven't been to your store in like a year. You can't say that, right? So this is our criteria for how we inspect and when we inspect. So let's talk about um, what I do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through how I go into a store because transparency really is the key. I will walk into the store and I'll say, how you doing? I'm Officer Senna. I'm with the EVAT unit. I'm here to inspect your store. Okay, I introduce myself, make it very transparent. I tell them, yes, we're going to go behind the counter. We're going to go behind the bar and you, are, you do not have to close the store. Your store can remain open, okay? Because I know if, if officers come in and close the store, man, that's 30 minutes that they have to close down the business. They're gonna lose some money, okay? So I let them stay open unless I start finding things. So I found Kraken stores. I found uh, assault rifles. I found some really serious stuff. At that point, when I know I'm gonna arrest the clerk and start Mirandizing them and, and start taking them in custody, the, the door gets shut and locked. And that's it, everyone leaves. So that's, that's kind of the caveat. But normally the store just stays open, routine inspection. You know, I always go in with a partner um, because it's just safer that way. I usually deal with the clerk, I check the licenses. You know, he'll go behind the counter and start, you know, looking at things, you know, how the alcohol is stored, um, you know, looking for the other problems, like we said, rodents, expired products, that sort of thing, graffiti, on and on. So that's how we do it. So let's say I go into a store and I find graffiti. Okay, so what I do is I will write up what's called the nuisance abatement notice. And it's this one right here, and I'll pass it around. Maybe, hopefully, it'll get to the end of everyone. 
And basically, it's a bunch of check the boxes. But I can also write in other violations. So if I find narcotics in the store, I can write that H&S violation. So I, I write up what's wrong, and then on there is a compliance state. So the compliance state is what I want it to be, OK? I don't like to write 10 minutes on there usually because it really uh, agitates them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm reasonable. It's, it's, it's a reasonable officer. So let's say there's graffiti. I'll document the graffiti, I'll write them up, and I'll say, OK, three days. I'm going to come back in three days. Okay, litter, I usually do 24 hours because you know you should go out and sweep, right? Let's say there's broken windows or rodents. So well, I might give them a month, okay? And usually it's a negotiation. <laughs> you know, so I'll go in there and I'll say, when can you get it fixed by? And I'm thinking I'm gonna give them two weeks. They'll say, oh, next week. I said, okay, sold. <laughs> so now let's say they don't listen to me because they don't like me, okay? I don't like you, Officer Senna. You can take that notice and you know, shove it. Okay, so when I go back and do my next inspection and they fail and they're still graffiti, I issue them a $200 fee charge. Okay, it is not a citation, so there's no due process, no judge involved. It is paying for my time to come back. That's where the police uh, reimbursement comes in. So it's a $200 fee charge. I can give them this charge every day if I want to until the viol violation is fixed. But again, I'm reasonable. I'll give them another week you know, to, to fix the violation. So it's very fair. I think the record is three that I've had to do. At one particular store, he just, he just couldn't get it together. Um, and then finally, you know, he took things seriously. But you know, we bill them through our office. That's why we have the, staff, the civilian staff. They get invoice and then they pay it. Let's say they don't pay it. I don't like you, I'm not paying it. Well, that could affect their tobacco retail. We have a tobacco retail license as well. It could affect them getting that the following year because we do control that. We are the licensing agency for that. And it just goes to collections. Big deal. I don't care, right? Send it off to collections. That's it. But I do not go in and collect fees. I, I'm not just stop, right? So they have to pay through our, uh, through our civilian staff. So that's reinspection fee charges and nuisance abatement notices. And this is for minor things. You know, this is for the lower hanging fruit, loitering, litter, graffiti, um, like expired products, nuisance stuff. Um, I don't necessarily write a nuisance abatement form if I find crack in the register, right? So, <laughs> I arrest them. <laughs> okay, so here's what they look like. Um, again, they're being passed around. So other enforcement uh, operations, so we were lucky enough, uh, the state of California, Alcoholic Beverage Control was very generous we applied for a grant and they gave us $90,000 this year. And we are very thankful and we are working closely with the agents to run minor decoy operations, shoulder tags, anti-loitering. And this pays for me to work overtime because just inspecting is a full-time job. If it takes me 18 months to go to every store, you can imagine I don't have time to do this stuff. So we do this stuff on overtime. Uh, we also do single cigarette and paraphernalia enforcement. This is for my tobacco folks, um, 308. I think it's 0.2 or 0.3 single cigarettes um, are illegal. It's just an infraction. But in our department, if they sell a single cigarette, it's a $1,000 fine for the tobacco. It, and it goes against their tobacco license. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, and we also will go in there and buy crack pipes. Not necessarily against the liquor license, but we really hammer them on the, on the tobacco license, which is a whole nother presentation that we don't have time to do today. So. This is just a snapshot of our 2013 enforcement activity. So as you can see, out of all the stores, we went to 544, we did 544 inspections, um, and only five bars. I mean, we just didn't have time to go everywhere. Next, this year is gonna be different though because we have the overtime funds to actually go out and do the bar inspections. And these bar compliance inspections were the very big problem ones. Problem, problem bars. Um, abatement notices, 90, community outreach. We go to community meetings all the time. Um, per ad request, um, so I don't have time to go to everyone. Um, and then if they have a problem with a location, you know, I'll go in and speak. I'm usually with uh, Eli here. And we're standing up there like this, you know. They're, uh, it's interesting. Um, crime prevention through environmental design reports. Um, I am uh, certified, post-certified. So that's part of our strategy. Um, I will do um, a crime prevention assessment of the a problem location and give them tips on how they can make the location uh, safer. We only did one last year. And again, this is our alcohol, tobacco, and shoulder tap operations. So I can see they're pretty, pretty standard. 
probably similar. So this is a, a comparison. So in 2014, we're already up to 318 inspections. Uh, so we're right on par to, to exceed um, 151 abatement notices and 21 reinspection fees. Now, there's a reason why the abatement notices are so high. So I was getting a lot of pushback from the stores. They're like, Officer Senna, you're just coming in here and hammering us, and it's always negative. So I said, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. If you pass the inspection with flying colors, I'm going to give you a notice that says no violations. Okay, and then you can hang up in the store, you can put it in your office, and so that's why we're going to have higher numbers. So basically, it's just a clean, clean inspection report. So we do that as well. Okay, so let's go into uh, education. I got another story for you. So we hold this yearly educational um, training seminar. We bring in uh, members from uh, ABC to do lead training, which is licensee education against drugs and alcohol. Um, we bring in the city attorney to talk about legal parameters, uh, vector. We bring all these agencies in so they can meet these inspectors. So we had a nice seminar, and afterwards, uh, one of the merchants came up to me. And he goes, Officer Cena, I got a question for you. And I'm like, what? He goes, a weird thing happened. He said, he said, a week ago, an inspector came in and shook my clerk down for money. I was like, really? So I'm thinking, oh, who's, who's on the take, right? Who is it? So I said, all right. I said, do you want to make a police report? Yes, I do. I go, do you have it on video still? Yes, I do. Excellent, OK? So I go down to the store. The next day, I met with him. And it was a guy dressed in a suit, kind of looked like Elias here. It wasn't Elias. <laughs> He goes into the store, he makes contact with the clerk, and this was a gas, this was like a, um, uh, it's called, we call it Alaska gas, it's like a gas station, you know, that has like a little kiosk um, inside. So he goes in there, he displays a gold badge, and basically goes around and points out that there's labor code violations. You don't have this poster, you don't have that poster, labor, labor, labor code violations. And then he says, I'm going to take you to jail and cite you or you can just give me $500 for the violations. So the, so the clerk called the owner. The owner says, yes, do what he says. He's an inspector. Just, pay, just give him the money, right? Left no business card, nothing. He walks out the door. So that's what the video is. So I'm like, OK, this, this appears to be either a real investigator that's on the take, or it's just some random dude pretending to be an, an inspector, right? So. What I do is I, I write up my police report. I kid you not, I'm going back to the station, and then a call comes out of the hotel of a false investigator, or the investigator shaking down the hotel for money. I go there, and it's the same dude. <laughs> <laughs> Patrol officers got there first. I go up there, and I'm like, you guys won't believe this. This guy just shook down one of my stores, right? So we, we picked up the clerk. I mean, the uh, yeah, we picked up the clerk, brought him in. He positively did a field identification. Good, he's good to go. So now I know I have more victims, right? So what I did, let me see if I can find it here. I did a merchant alert, okay? This was the first one done. I'll pass this around. I took the guy's booking photo, didn't put his name, and I said, hey, this guy's impersonating an inspector in the city of Oakland and surrounding counties, and if you know any information about it, give me a call. I got eight calls that week, okay? Of the merchants who called, uh, four agreed to come in and talk to me. Uh, two had video. Same guy, right? So I was really excited about this case. Uh, we got it charged. Um, guy went to court. It's actually, unfortunately, it's a misdemeanor. Um, so he pled out, but he left the county. He's gone. Um, that was the aha moment where the stores really started to trust the ABAT unit because, you know, that was where we, we solved a major problem for them because this guy was coming in shaking them down. So it was good. Um, so in the education, I go over that now. You know, when inspectors come in, they need to show you their business card, their badge. They should always introduce themselves. So we don't have this happen again, right? We also teach them about the deem the proof standards. We explain the whole program. And then we give them a very nice certificate of completion. Um, it's very cool. I didn't bring one. I wish I would have. And they display it on their stores. They are so proud that they went to our training. Um, and then we also do other, I wanted to show another merchant. This kind of is more for the bars. Um, so early in the year, we had a lot of problems. Um, a few, few of our locations were having new dancers, uh, semi-new dancers, and there's an open municipal code that does not allow that. 
So instead of going to every location, what I did is I did a flyer, and I couldn't put the photos in here because they were not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not in here, but we do merchant. You know, we'll do mass mail outs to all our all our locations to let them know um, what's going on. And, and after that, all the complaints stopped. They just complied, just on a flyer. Um, so that was really good. This is our attendance chart. It ebbs and flows depending on when we have it. We, you know, we can have the training in April. I think this year we're going to have it in October. Um, one year we actually had to cancel in 2010 because I think we got only five people that RSVP'd, but our store owners, um, they, they tend to just show up, kind of like some people probably did in here, you know? So, <laughs> so I don't think I'm going to be canceling more trainings, but um, yeah, so this is, it ranges anywhere from 50 down to the 20s, um, and we can't hold more than 50 people, we just don't have the facility for it. So if we have a need for more, we, we, we can bump it up to two a year. So I'm going to go into the examples of the training. So we're going to look at some slides. So I show them this. Why do I do that? Okay, as cops, you know, we all know that, hey, drinking in public and people passed out in your store is not allowed, but they might not necessarily know this or care, right? So I say, hey, if, if, if this lady's coming in your store, someone like this, don't refuse, refuse to sell. You're the front line, right? Yes, I can go in and cite her and arrest her, but you can stop the problem immediately, right? And then the same thing for, uh, you know, if there's, uh, you know, drunk teenagers, not drunk teenagers, drunk adults, young adults going into bars, same thing. If they're rowdy, you know, refuse to, refuse to sell. So we want to make sure that this doesn't happen around their stores. That's what I tell them. No loitering and no public drunkenness. And if it does happen, you call us and we'll come out and help you. Minor decoys. So... Um, we do a lot of this, and I like to show them how, how it actually works. Um, you know, I tell them, hey, a minor's going to come in. They're going to be told to tell the truth. I'm, I'm very transparent. You're going to ask for the, you know, they're going to present the ID. And that's it. They're going to try and buy a beer. No tricks. I'm not going to lie. Um, so I explain the whole program and the repercussions. So the repercussions are is that ABC is going to become aware of it, and you're going to be looking at some suspension days and fines. Also, if it's a repeated program, problem, we would give it to Mr. Farron, and then we could possibly do um, a case against their land use, against their deemed approved status. I show them this. Now, I don't know about you, but this has confused people, okay? <laughs> we just had a minor decoy operation last week, and the minor presented the ID. They asked for ID every time. Two of the stores sold anyway. They don't read the birthday. And they don't get it that this is a clue when it's vertical that they should really look a little closer, right? So um, I, I show them that this is the valid ID. I tell them the IDs that they can't accept. Um, so when you get into the uh, consulate cards and that sort of thing that doesn't have a birthday and physical description, that's not a valid ID, okay? So I said you're taking a risk if you, if you accept that. So I show them the IDs. This is what they look like. And a lot of our merchants, uh, especially the liquor stores, are come, came over from the Middle East, came over from Yemen, so uh, they don't understand really a lot. Some of them don't understand what this looks like. So now we're going to go into our deemed approved violations. So what's wrong with this store? And this is a store in Oakland, <laughs> like in 2008. Oh, yeah, windows covered, graffiti. It's a mess. Would you go shop there? I, I don't think I would. So... <laughs> We got poor window visibility, graffiti, trash, that sort of thing, right? So if I was inspecting, I would go in there and I'd write them up for these violations. Okay, next one. Now this is not a typical store, but it does happen. So we got these gentlemen here dealing crack, drugs, gambling in front of the store. Now you can't tell me the store owner isn't aware that's going on, okay? This is the kind of stores that this program was uh, designed to uh, deal with, okay? So loitering, drug dealing, okay? We don't want that in front of the stores. What about this store? What's wrong here? Graffiti, right? Payphone? <laughs> we don't see those very often. But is there calls coming in? That's actually a rule, right? But then also, where's the no loitering sign? It's required, right? They need to have it. And the grass, this is more of a, a aesthetic thing, but I'll say, hey, go. Why don't you go cut the grass, you know? 
uh, make your store look nicer and presentable. You know, I'll ask them to do that. And nine times out of ten, they, they comply, no problem. All right, so no loitering sign is faded, so it's there, but it's, Ill it's not legible. Okay, litter in the trash. See how there's a trash can, but people don't use it, you know? So that's where the merchant needs to uh, take care to go out and sweep more often than once a day. Okay, this is posed. <laughs> and they're not open containers. So I saw these guys, I was doing actually a loitering enforcement, and I saw them. They had just gotten a sandwich, um, and they're sitting out there. They're going to crack open uh, these beers. I said, oh, you better not do that. I actually thought they were open, but they weren't. And I said, hey, I'm doing some training for merchants. Would you mind posing in front of the store like you're tipping? And they said, yeah, sure, Sina, we'll do it. So I thought it was kind of cute. So we got loitering in open containers. So okay, Septet, I touched on it briefly. So this is reserved for the very, very problematic locations. So if we're going to do a deemed approved uh, case against a store, automatically I'm going to do a Septet. Okay, this is how I help them. Okay, I tell them, hey, it's dark in front of your store. You need more lighting. Hey, maybe we could get you to put some cameras in front so when a crime does occur, you know, you can help the police department out. You know, hey, why don't your clerks go to the training, right? We do a whole assessment of the interior and exterior of the store. It's a written report. Um, and then when they don't abide by it, right, they got to explain to the judge, hey, why, why Officer Senna came out and did this septet report? Why didn't you follow any of her suggestions? Okay, I do recommend though for law, my law enforcement officers in here that you, uh, they do attend a uh, post-certified course. It's usually a week-long course to get certified on it. Um, I took a, a course in um, San Jose a few years ago. And also actually have branched off into hotels and motels and single res residency occupancy. So I've been doing a lot of overtime on that for these subject. Very good tool. Okay, so we also attend community meetings. Um, and I touched briefly on the hotline. Um, so at any time, the citizens can call in anonymously and leave tips for us. We sometimes have merchants that leave tips. Um, a lot of times, the merchants actually call me direct, believe it or not. And I have such a good relationship with them, they'll call in and snitch each other out. Snitch is kind of not a nice word, but that's, you know, that's what we call it in Oakland. And they'll say, hey, um, you know, this store over here is selling drugs. I think you need to go over there and check them out. But I didn't tell you. So, you know. Uh, it's a good way for uh, us to get communication on the bad problem locations. So I will now turn it over to Elias to do our case study on Ebers. This was a very, very fun case for me because I was invited to a community meeting by a police captain. So I guess if there's any attorneys here, be careful when you're invited to community meetings by the police captains, because I got yelled at by 120 community members. <laughs> and like, he like, ducked out the side and left me. And it was, you know, I didn't really have anything to do with what they were talking about. So. so this bar came to our attention because there were big three shootings. And one of the shootings, somebody actually had a weapon in the bar, flashed people in the bar, so everybody knew that the guy had a weapon and basically chased somebody outside the bar and started shooting at them. Multiple fights in the bar. I think maybe even some employees were fighting with people. Noise complaints inside and outside. Uh, inside because of the jukebox. Outside because of the loitering. People will wait outside, just yell, fight, shoot each other, do drugs, all kind of fun things. Uh, once again, drug uh, usage was very high out there. Uh, they were serving to a lot of intoxicated individuals, so people were passing out in their cars, so they wouldn't even leave um, the street. They were just stuck in the car, passed out, and neighbors were complaining about it. It got so bad that a private investigator was hired by the business district. So other businesses, other bars, restaurants, gas stations hired a, bus I mean, a private investigator, and this guy had maybe a 100-page report they gave me, and it documented everything from the drug deals inside the bathroom, the drug deals outside, people having guns, serving intoxicated people. They also had a problem with graffiti. They would constantly, um, they probably would get tagged and nobody would do anything about it. So here's the location, or here's the bar. That very attractive older gentleman is actually the owner. If I could give anybody, any attorneys, any advice here, when you do any um, conditions with regards to 
requiring security, make sure the owner doesn't go out and get a VSIS card. Because he went out and got a security card, we required two security guards there, and he, in essence, became one of the security guards. And uh, he really wasn't scaring anybody, and he actually was inviting some of the uh, pot users to come inside and smoke weed so the police wouldn't see him. So I learned a lot from that one. So the city attorney response was very easy. Remember the property owner. Um, typically in our cases, the property owner and the business owners are two separate individuals. In this case, I guess legally, they were two separate individuals, but they were owned by two corporations that were owned by the husband and the wife. So technically, they were, or legally, they were two separate owners, but they were really owned by the same people. Uh, once I met with the community, got yelled at by over 120 people, and got left by a police captain. Always fun. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I got yelled at so much that a FBI agent was actually texting Jennifer Senna about it, like, oh my God, you guys need to help this guy. So, <laughs> so now whenever that captain invites me to anything, I'm like, wait a minute, like, <laughs> who's going to be there? How many people are going to be there? Am I going to get yelled at? So that's my ground rules now. And we actually came, uh, so Jennifer came in and did a septet report helped out with the lighting and everything else. Also with the jukebox, uh, maybe measuring how loud the jukebox was, could you hear it outside? And we came to a negotiated settlement agreement with conditions. So a lot of it were very, very basic, but um, basically the agreement and the conditions mirrored the problems we saw in the police reports. So somebody had a gun in there, so we required them to wand people because there was a gun inside. Uh, because of the drug use, we said you can't have drug use inside of the building. So if we find drug use, no matter what, it's an automatic revocation. We also required two security guards because typically they had one security guard and that obviously wasn't enough because of the fights, because of the drinking and everything else. But uh, they kind of sidestepped that and the owner got his BSIS license. But um, currently, because they continue to break their, um, their conditions, they're currently selling the property. So, which is like a really, really good thing for us. Actually, the new property owner has already come in. He contacted the captain and contacted community members. He sat down with maybe three members from the community, like regular community members, um, someone from the business district, and gave, told everybody what his plans were, and everybody's like really excited to bring him on. And I know like a lot of business owners may be afraid about the conditions and what happens, but with this particular situation, the community members actually wanted to um, us to ease up on the conditions because they knew the, pre the new owner, and the new owner has such a great reputation that it doesn't make sense for them to want people coming into the bar if they're trying to sell 10 or $15 drinks. I don't go to a lot of 10 or $15 drink places, but I wouldn't want to be wanted if I'm spending $15 on a drink. And going into Golden 7, Jen's going to handle that one. So we're going to change the mic over. Okay, this was an interesting store case. So um, this particular store um, plagued with drug dealing. It's in a in a very high crime, high narcotic area. Um, I was constantly getting um, you know reports of people selling drugs out of the store, using drugs. But every time I went to an inspection. It was always a big uh, zero, right? So I obtained a confidential informant and I had him go in and do some narcotic buys. I was very surprised when he was buying cot. Anyone know what cot is? Yeah, okay. It is illegal to schedule um, four, I think it's a two, four uh, combination scheduled narcotic. Um, so went in there, uh, did three buys um, of the narcotics. We ended up finding out it was actually the brother of the licensee. Um, so, did the bias, got it charged, got the dope uh, tested, came back positive, got it charged with the DA, got a, an arrest warrant for the brother. So we, Elias and I, decided to do something kind of fun. <laughs> we call them in and uh, we say, hey, you know, there's a problem here um, at your store and we got a lot of pushback. You don't know what you're talking about. You can't prove that. You can't prove anything. And I arrested the brother for the warrant right there. 
while he was in, in, our, uh, in our meeting. It was, it was pretty cool, right Elias? <laughs> so then we proposed, uh, we proposed conditions and they signed right then and there. He's, the property owner and the brothers like, hey, I don't want anything to do with this. We had no idea that's what he's doing. It's very serious. We want to we wanna do the conditions. So here's what the conditions were. Security guard during certain hours. The brother is banned from the store. Can't be there anymore. Um, we did uh, lighting, cameras, kind of the, the normal stuff. But it was a real big win for our city. Um, and let me show you the after, before and after, because I think it tells everything. So this is before, you know, kind of, you know, and then there's, I'm surprised I didn't get a loiter or a drug dealer in there because it, it was just everywhere. And look what he did to his store now. This was taken last week. Isn't that beautiful? He actually did a lot of improvements. And, and this whole thing right here, this whole flower bed, you know why he did that? Because people were standing against the store and he couldn't see them through his cameras. So now they have to stand in the sidewalk and it's easier for him to see. And I thought, wow, that's, that's Step Ted right there, right? Pretty ingenious. Um, and actually I'm, I actually became very good friends with the property owner, very nice guy, and worked with him on a lot of other stores as well. So it's actually a very positive thing for the community, and things have really died down there. So I'll let uh, Elias talk about considerations. This is our last slide. So it just means to think about the loss of the land use status does not mean the store will close. So it's just going to stop the sale of alcohol from that particular location. So ABC license is not affected. The new owner can always apply for a new CUP at the location. They can always sell their license to somebody else within that county or keep the license and keep it inactive. And this is our contact information. 